uh, issues of access, being able to access health facilities, health uh, um, access to medicine. It involves even the determinants, the, the right to sanitation, right to uh, water, all those that determine uh, we draw from in the objectives of the government, we have said the right to access health services, we draw from that. And that's what Sehad is trying to, to achieve or to go to, to look for, is that that right is recognized in the constitution outrightly. Otherwise, for now, we draw it from different uh, angles, from the objectives, and it is to say that everyone has a right to the highest attainable standard of mental and physical health. And that is a lot, uh, all those components that I have mentioned uh, in terms of the quality, even the quality of, of health care that you, you, your, you can uh, attain. It is in terms of uh, are you able to, uh, even in terms of the right to education, right, all those are determinants for health. So there's a determinants to health and then the actual access. So do you have that as, a, as an individual, all those are things that determine the right to health or for an individual. So now, the right to health, how connected is it to development? Does it impact in any way on personal and community development? Yes, I, I, I want to believe that you cannot achieve economic development with a sick uh, population because for people to go out and make money and pay the taxes, uh, you know, conduct their businesses, they have to be healthy, they have to be in a, a right state of health for them to do that. And I think even our, our vision, our uh, plans for the government visions that they put in, in, in place, the health sector uh, strategic plan, all of, all of them speak to health in terms of economic, being a, 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 a driver for economic growth. So you have to have a health population, a healthy population to be able to you know, realize economic development. Now, when you, when we talk about CEHAD, Center for Health, Human Rights and Development, for, understand, you've been in operation for 10 years and working in these areas of development, human rights and health. Uh, what exactly have you done to enhance or to promote the right to health which exactly we are talking about. Yeah. So um, our mission, first of all, is to advance uh, health rights to, for the vulnerable population. And we use different strategies to achieve that. We have uh, about four strategies that we use in terms of how the organization is um, st structured. And one of them is strategic litigation, where we challenge some of the policies that are existing that, that hinder the realization of the right to health. And we do that through analysis. First of all, we first analyze those policies, those laws that may in any way hinder or have access to or the realization of the right to health. And once we have those, uh, some of those identified, we do the strategic litigation to influence the policy through courts of law, through um, public interest litigation. And we also have a community empowerment where we speak to the communities on their right to health. What does it mean? Break it down for them. Have, you know, uh, um, capacity building or trainings for the leaders to, sh to see that they support in realization of the right to health. But also we have advocacy, which is to, to, to you know, make your voice loud for those vulnerable communities that cannot speak for them, represent their voices, bring them on the table to speak with policymakers, to, to um, you know, have the conversation on those issues that may not be working, but also to demand that government does its responsibility. Because first, the government has a responsibility to respect, the, the, because the right to health is a human right. So it has a responsibility to, um, to respect, it has a responsibility to uh, provide for, to, you know, that uh, uh, right to health. And also, we need to, for our advocacy, to compel government to do that, its obligation to do that, to, re to make sure that people realize that right. We also have a knowledge management uh, strategy, I mean a structure, where we build evidence so that our advocacy is not just uh, from 
uh, a place of, of uh, presuppositions or what we think, but there's evidence that is built from research, you know, to speak to those uh, issues where we see this uh, could influence that realization or to to move us towards that realization of the right to health. So we, we've we done a number of, of uh, things. As I had for the last 10 years, uh, we've had 30, about 35 cases that were um, uh, is instituted or uh, uh, taken into different courts. Some of those cases were, uh, you know, challenging government on issues of policy. And uh, I think one major case or strategic case that we can say for sure that Sehad uh, has contributed a lot was towards the maternal health uh, to, to realize that uh, women, because government has an uh, obligation to see that women can are uh, able to fulfill their unique maternal health, uh, unique maternal function. So the access to maternal health, uh, you know, we had that, that case that was filed and we, we've, we've really raised awareness around maternal health. We've had coalitions built around it and the case was uh, taken to constitutional case, I mean constitutional court and at first it was taken as political, but we wanted to stay almost, actually they dismissed it as political, but the Supreme Court, we went to the Supreme Court and it was declared that this is an issue that is urgent and the, case, the Constitutional Court was ordered to to hear the case. So that shows that, you know, even up to Supreme Court, they realize the, the, the seriousness or the importance of government um, or fulfilling its obligation for women and girls to be able to fulfill their, you know, unique maternal functions. So, and ensure that the services, the, you know, healthcare, the uh, emergency obstetric care is available for women and girls. Of course, that case is not yet finalized. It's still at constitutional court to be had, but we've had, uh, that's one of the things I think a milestone in terms of contributing to the realization to right to health, especially for maternal health. Uh, the other things that uh, Sehad has done is we've had, we have a lot, you know, partnerships. We've had uh, strong partnerships with uh, policy makers because the work that we do requires alliances with policy makers, requires, if we are going to speak to policies, we need to be, bring them to, to a table to have that conversation around issues like mm -hmm. even, as, you know, sexual reproductive health rights. Uh, issues on access to blood, issues of, you know, different issues that touch uh, the re or ensure that we have the right to health or people have access to those commodities, have access to the services that they need. So we've had um, champions, you know, around uh, those issues that we advocate for in, under the right to health. Uh, we've had, uh, you know, members of parliament who walk with us on the streets when we are campaigning, advocating for this. We have one of those days that we, we commemorate is the International Day of Maternal Health Day, which is usually on the 11th, always on the 11th of April. And we've had major activities and events to raise awareness, but also to, to bring other people on board, to interest them in the issues that touch people's health and to realize that this is a right that needs to actually be recognized in, the cost, in our constitution uh, outright. So those are some of the things. And we also in community, we've created networks for in, to, in different uh, districts that we operate in, which is about 10 to 12 districts that we operate in. We have uh, community health advocates and we use that channel to be able to reach to the grassroots, you know, to have a grassroots network and to reach to the people at the grassroots level to make sure that they know what their right to health is, but also be able to bring them on board when we are going to speak at the with the policy makers, we have a conversation with them, we bring them to bring those community voices and use their voices, mobilize them to to influence policy as well. Because sometimes uh, Advocating for people without them at the table may seem, uh, you know, it may be different. But when you bring them to the table and the policymakers are able to see what the 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 needs are and to respond to those needs that are within the community. So those are some of the things that Sehad has done. Of course, there are many others, but. Uh,
So yeah, I will just highlight those. So now, in uh, <coughs> 10 years, uh, we must say that uh, definitely you can't demand for something you don't know. So this brings me to this idea, to this question of the level of awareness. Are Ugandans out there aware of what the right to health entails from the 10 years of experience, the 10 years of interaction with these people, the 10 years of working in different communities? What's the, the level of aware, awareness among Ugandans? I think, I think I would say that as they had, we have made a contribution to raising that awareness. And again, we, through talk shows, through uh, you know meetings, dialogues, we've had uh, national dialogues, we've had community dialogues, we've had uh, you know even representation at international levels, and all in that in terms of uh, raising that awareness on issues that that touch the right to health. But of course, we cannot say that. Um, everyone knows about this 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 right because again sometimes our scope of work is limited to where we can is limited to maybe the resources that are available and uh, the commitments that you've made as an organization we we don't have uh, apart from the community health advocates that that we use to go to those districts we are not we don't have presence in every district but again they are partners we are not alone because we've at least been pioneers, maybe I could say, but there are other partners who have come on board who are also working in different districts to raise that awareness in terms of, you know, people knowing their right to health, their right to health and what it entails. So there are different uh, partners, I think, contributing to that. And I could say that I think from where we were 10 years ago, it's, uh, it's a good place, I think, where we are with uh, I would say that we are not at the same place where we were 10 years before. When the issues of, you know, I think the rights that were at that time highlighted were more political, civil, uh, civil rights, you know, civic uh, rights, but not really health. So we, we could say that I think for Sehad was uh, the contribution that has pioneered for other partners to also come on board and to continue to raise this awareness. And for Sehad itself as an organization, I think we've done well in terms of you know, ensuring that many people are on board, many people know, uh, raising that awareness to many people to know. We've done this through radio talk shows I had mentioned, and different uh, activities, campaigns, different campaigns that we've uh, had over the past 10 years. So I would say I think it's, um, we're not there. We would want everyone to know what their right is, you know, at, from every corner of the country. But but I think we are somewhere that's a good place to, to continue the work that we are doing uh, together with the different partners that are um, also speaking to the right to health. It's obvious that we cannot talk about rights without talking about responsibilities. In regard to right to health, are Ugandans fulfilling their part of, of the story? Are they doing what they are supposed to do? One to attain this health, but also to enjoy this health, or to demand this health, or right health? Yeah, I think uh, in terms of, uh, to say, their responsibility, when it's, it could be maybe in terms of uh, the primary health care, uh, and that's also a responsibility that also falls on, on government, but also on institutions of, of education. So maybe private, private uh, uh, partners, is, let's say in schools, are there health, uh, you know, toilets that, that uh, uh, are sufficient for, to keep the, in terms of the school, the population and all those. So those primary health care issues that also determine uh, the you know, the right to health, especially for children who go to schools. They're, so the, the education, people who set up schools as form of business, they need to also take that responsibility to ensure that they are clean, uh, the, you know, the environment that uh, children are in are, is healthy. They to ensure, you know, sanitation is a responsibility for people who have chosen to be uh, in, to go into businesses that are of, of a public nature, uh, restaurants or any other, those, they need to take, uh, that's probably their responsibility to ensure that there's that primary health in terms of prevention of disease. So that's, I think, for citizens, that's where it would be. And of course, every person has, you, you, you are responsible in terms of 
your own health to like right now what they're saying you have to wear a mask you have to wash your hands you have to distance yourself not to catch the you know the current uh, virus that is ongoing the COVID-19 so those I think from in terms of uh, the population or Ugandans, that's where your responsibility would be. But uh, in terms of access, those facilities need to be there, and that's the responsibility for government. They need to be, I think the right to health should not be um, uh, overly, uh, let me say, in terms of responsibility, should not overly fall on the person, apart from the preventive uh, measures in, term, the, in terms of responsibility, doesn't really uh, have lie on the individual uh, from the perspective of access or whatever. Those facilities should be there and government should be able to provide for those facilities and commodities. But your responsibility as a citizen is in terms of primary health care, which is ensuring those underlying determinants if you're able to um, you know the the uh, sanitation water and all those things if you're able to uh, prevent some of the diseases especially on the non-communicable diseases your health your lifestyle that's your responsibility that, because there are diseases which are as a result of lifestyle so i think i think i would say that that's for for Ugandans, that's your responsibility to check your, your lifestyle and those issues that you can control to prevent, uh, you know, uh, getting disease. That within that is those things that are within your control to do that. Civil society organizations like SEAD have done enough over the years to promote and advance the right to health for each and every person, including the marginalized communities. Can we say that the government has done enough or has played its part in this cause? I would say yes and no. Yes to say they have done something. It's not that you know nothing has happened, nothing. At least there is something that the government has done. Even in terms of ensuring that those policies are there, the health policies that are that uh, promote you know health to a certain extent, they are there in place. And health facilities are there. They may not be sufficient, uh, but at least there's you know some progress in terms of uh, you know ensuring that there's access. But uh, there's still a lot to be done, and uh, I think in terms of the healthcare system, there's uh, which to ensure that the health workers that are there are enough, you know, for the population, to ensure that commodities are there, uh, you know, the health sector is well financed to ensure those, those uh, whatever is needed is there. Uh, I think that government still has a lot to do uh, in terms of uh, those, you know, even even uh, the quality of health care because we, we've seen, you know, stories of people going to hospitals and there are no gloves and then there are and those are public health uh, public health facilities, there are no gloves, there's no, the blood is not there, this, uh, the medicine is out of stock, this, uh, that, that's, I think government still has to ensure that those things are there and if it's not, they are not there, then it's not doing enough, it's not, it's not prioritizing the health sector uh, enough and I think we've had a little bit of uh, uh, an eye opener in this season of COVID where we've seen that the health, our healthcare is not very uh, as strong as we would want it to be. There's a little, you know, more to, to be required in terms of uh, seeing that the, it is sufficient for to serve the population that are of uh, Uganda. So we, I think government can still do uh, more in ensuring that there are enough health workers uh, in, in hospitals, the health workers are facilitated uh, well and also the, yeah, the welfare of health workers. We saw health workers not being able to access health facilities because there was limitation on transportation and in most uh, places the health workers should be be able to have facilities where they um, at, at the hospitals, you know, within the hospitals where they can stay to make you when they have night duties, when they have, but they don't have those facilities. The health centers don't have those facilities, and the health workers are not maybe even remunerated uh, well. And we've had uh, issues of uh, understaffing, you know, 
the midwives having to attend to so many at in one day even the mental health of that health worker by the end of the day you know maybe sometimes we lose lives because of that that they are not uh, they are not enough health workers to serve the population that we have so that's a responsibility that government i mean about that that uh, government still needs to work on to to do and ensuring that the health sector is prioritized in terms of financing to, to because all those things need require money and also they've had uh, issues of where health facilities that need to do need to or, uh, need to have blood they don't have the right uh, infrastructure in terms of being able to even store the blood that they need uh, when it's there from the blood bank, but they can't because they don't have the cold rooms, they don't have the fridges, they don't have, you know, uh, the, the, what it requires to have those commodities within their facilities. And also, uh, in, in terms of the teams that even collect that blood, they, they, they have had uh, that they are, they are not able to collect enough. In, in sometimes the challenge is that the teams that the, the, the teams that are with they are not enough. So I think that government can still do uh, more. And also the issue of logistics for the other health, the health facilities who, who, who've uh, been informed they are not able sometimes to even go and collect blood because they don't have transport. We've seen uh, people uh, on the road with, uh, who have got accidents and they have to be put on the police car, which is so, uh, you know, that they call it, referred to it as Kabangali. There should be ambulances. There should be ambulances on the road to be to save lives. Sometimes people people's lives are lost because there is no ambulance on the road. Maybe someone's life uh, could have been saved because the first hour of an accident is the most critical for that part, life to be saved or to be lost. So. We don't have functional ambulances at health facilities. People struggle. The women giving birth, they don't have beds to, to sleep on in, in those health facilities where a, a woman who has given birth is being told, you need to go so that you make room for another person. But yet she needs the attention after, right after she's given birth. Maybe she will be maybe sent home and then she overbleeds and you know. So she needs, she still needs, requires to be in hospital, but there's no space for them, for them to, you know, we've seen women sleeping on the floor after giving birth with their one day, a few hours born child. So I think that there's still more to be done in terms of the healthcare system and, uh, you know, the facilities, the, the infrastructure and the investment, the general investment into healthcare. I think there's still more uh, room and a lot more to be desired. No. There is a lot more to be desired, and that's the view of Diana Lumbasi from the Center for Health, Human Rights and Development. We are going to take a break. When we come from the break, we will look at the healthcare budget for that financial year 2020-2021. We, we have a lot to discuss on this, and of course, budget has a direct relationship with how much our or how best our health system can do and how... We, we, we can perform. We will talk about all this more. Smart 24. Smart business. This week on Farm Smart, we discuss the fate of agricultural inputs on the market. Right now, what the National Drug Authority is doing is to control agro input dealers to see if you have a, a certificate or a permit to deal in those drugs, right? Are you registered with Uganda Veterinary Board? Are you registered with Uganda Medical Board? Uh, things like that. Is your pharmacy okay? But then from the pharmacy, where do these materials go? Who controls that flow from the pharmacy to the farmer? In most cases, farmers come.